We've talked about the one-dimensional discrete cosine transform, so how do we take this to two dimensions? Well, in the context of doing the one-dimensional DCT, we came up with a matrix C, and we were basically saying that multiplication by that vector, or by that matrix, times our data vector would give us our DCT vector. And the DCT vector, again, just like the Fourier transform, was effectively coefficients of different cosine terms. Now, let's imagine that I took that C and instead multiplied it by a single vector. What if I took it and multiplied it by a matrix? Well, effectively, what that would do, it would do the DCT to each column separately. So if my x vector was an x1, x2, up to xn, probably should be lowering those 0 to n minus 1, but whatever. If I took c times x vector, I would get c x1, c x2, all the way up to c xn. But then that's only really applying the DCT in one dimension. We're applying the DC to the columns, but we haven't compressed the rows at all. We haven't done anything with them. Well, it turns out that same matrix can be used to do it. I just need to use it so that that matrix applies to the rows instead of the columns. And the way we can get it to do that is just say, I still want to do the DCT to the columns like I did before, but then those new things, I can do the DCT to the rows by multiplying on the right by C transpose. Then what we have is we've basically got a big matrix of coefficients. But how do we use those coefficients to get back? How do I create these cosine functions that go through the data points? Well, let's think about this. So what I'm really trying to do is I'm trying to find some function where I plug in i and j the coordinates in my matrix X, and it gives me that entry. Well, really, it just kind of comes a matter of tracing through some matrix multiplication stuff. But we do get a fairly complicated formula here. We get that X sub i j is 2 over n, times this double summation, y, k, l, a, k, a, l, cosine of all this stuff. In my mind, it's hard to trace through this whole summation thing and see what's going on. So I went ahead and thought about it a slightly different way here. So first of all, these a, k, and a, l's are just like they were for the one-dimensional discrete cosine transform, where if it was zero, I got a 1 over square root of 2, and if it was, or sorry, if it was 0, it was a 1, and if it was anything other than that, it was 1 over square root of 2. So, first thing I did, I took this and those two things and said, okay, corresponding to the different coefficients corresponding to the different things I get in the output from this two DC, two-dimensional DCT, that would all collapse down into this. We have a huge block. Most of the matrix is just 1 over n. Because most of the matrix, these things become 1 over square root of 2, 1 over square root of 2 times 1 over square root of 2 is a 1 half, times the 2 over n gives you a 1 over n. For the top left, 
both of these things are 1. So I just get the 2 over n. For the rest of the top row and top column, I'm getting then 2 over n times 1 over the square root of 2 times 1 gives me a square root of 2 over n. Okay, now I should be a little bit careful here. What I'm doing here with this matrix is I'm kind of creating a matrix of what are the different parts in the summation. So what we'd have to do is go through every entry in these matrices. And I'm not doing a matrix multiplication. I'm multiplying together the stuff that's in the same place of these different matrices. So we've got the coefficient that comes out of our DCT. We've got this constant that comes out of these terms. And then I've got these different cosine functions. What do those different cosine functions do? Well, one of them is one across the top row. So every time you're multiplying times something in the first row, it's just a one. And all the other ones are these cosine functions. And all the things have a cosine. They've got the 2i plus 1. they got the pi over the 2n. But the argument on the inside goes up by 1 each time. You can think about this top row as being a 0 there. This has a multiple of 1 on the inside. This has a multiple of 2 up to n minus 1. And that's the same for each column. If I'm looking at the separate cosines separately, one of them, it only depends what row we're in. The other one is the exact same thing with two little changes. One, we're looking at the J component rather than the I component. All these were I's. These are all J's. They're pretty much the same functions, but now they build going left to right rather than top to bottom. Still ones of the first one, one times the inside, two times the inside, up to n minus one times the inside. So altogether, you're getting n squared different terms in this huge summation, all of which are constants pulled out of the DCT, constants from the formula, and then a couple of cosine functions. It's a big mess. But, and honestly, given what we're trying to do here, sometimes it makes sense to do this kind of a thing because this really does break it down into individual cosine functions. And again, the idea is, overall, thinking in terms of this matrix, the closer that a term comes to the upper left, sort of the more important it is, the more impact it has on the thing. We can always get a least squares approximation to the whole thing by taking stuff closer up here. So something down here has very little impact on what we perceive. It looks pretty much the same, whether or not we got some of the stuff down here. The stuff up here makes more of an impact. So it's a common thing to choose some cutoff point and say, well, we're going to ignore everything down beyond that cutoff point. And only the terms up here matter. Now, that being said, all this summation, all this trace, if you're trying to figure out what's going on with this formula, there is an easier way to think about it. Let's go back to what we had here. If we think about that this is giving me a matrix Y, this is giving me the two-dimensional DCT, we can actually recover X very easily in a matrix way. And that's because C is a, an orthonormal matrix. And one of the things we know about orthonormal matrices is that their transpose is the inverse. So if I take this thing and I multiply it on the left by C transpose and on the right by C, I can say that I get X back by doing C transpose Y C. Honestly, 
this thing right here is where that huge summation formula comes from. It just traced through all the multiplications that would have to happen in doing this C transpose YC.